things are better, better left unknown. And I'll never find you here. Cause no one's ever, no one's ever is a community-driven radio. At times the community comments may reveal prejudices and other beliefs that we or our sponsors do not condone. Views or opinions expressed by the community, callers, or guests, are those of the individual speaking and do not represent the views or opinions of this site. Rippin' Common Sense content is intended for mature audiences only. Enjoy! This is My Life DIY and... Hi, this is JoJo. Hi, my name is Ash. Hey everybody, it's AJ the Rippin' Rabbit. This is Cynthia Sue Larson. This is your man Meta, aka Propagate This Light. And you're now listening to Dark Wolf's Den. The Dark Wolf's Den Show on Rippin' Common Sense Radio. This station is now the ultimate power in the universe. Are ghosts real? We had a thousand hours of continuous communication with the spirit world. 
Does time travel actually exist? The laws of physics seem to be compatible with time machines. You know, sometimes I wonder about reincarnation, don't you? A four-year-old boy in Adelaide, Australia, has told his parents that he used to be Britain's Prince Diana. What would happen if the world found out that aliens were real? I didn't say disclosure would be easy, but what is the alternative? To establish a space force as the sixth branch of the armed forces. We have so many questions and yet so little time, so to have you here, the pleasure is all mine. Coming to you from a secret mountain cave hidden deep within the Idaho wilderness. This is the Dark Wolf's Den Show. Now, here is your host, Jerry Hicks. That's right, I am Jerry Hicks, also known as the Dark Wolf. And we are broadcasting live across the multiverse from a secret mountain cave hidden high up in the beautifully snow-covered peaks of the Idaho mountains. That's right. We're ripping through the electromagnetic soup, tearing through the atmosphere, and tunneling away into your radio like a quantum particle. This is the Dark Wolf Stin Show for Thursday, April 15th, 2021. Uh, so whether you're on the edge of reality, the edge of the galaxy, or the edge of your seat, we're glad you chose us to be right there with you. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be covering a topic that I've touched on a multitude of times on different episodes, and that is, of course, the topic of Oop Arts. Oop what? Oop Arts. These are out-of-place artifacts. These are things that do not match the official archaeological narrative and things the archaeologists really don't like to talk about. Things that seem to be out of time and place with the given technology that we're told existed at whatever given time in history. We're going to discuss all that and more here in just a moment, but first... Today in History... On this day in 1865, Abraham Lincoln dies nine hours after he is shot while attending the play Our American Cousin at Ford's Theater in Washington on April 14th, 1865. And that is today's Today in History. And as we all know, I love the Today in History segment. That is always one of my favorite segments to do. And we can't always find a Today in History that matches up with the topic, but it's still always an intriguing thing, right? But history isn't always quite as we're told, is it? There's a narrative that is given to us that isn't necessarily always the true narrative. And archaeology is the worst. You guys know I rail against archaeology all the time on this show because they are the worst about practicing scientism and refuse to look at the real evidence that is brought up, like the real evidence of -of out-of-place artifacts. These are artifacts that exist in times that they should not exist. For instance, the most well-known among these would be Gobekli Tepe, right? Gobekli Tepe is dated back to 11,000 years ago. To me, that is an oopart. Why? Because according to science, that didn't exist. There wasn't a civilization 11,000 years ago, let alone one that had the knowledge, tools, and ability to build such a structure as, say, Gobekli Tepe. And then they found Gobekli Tepe in Turkey and realized that their narrative was wrong. It was out of place in the narrative that they had. It was, for lack of a better term, an out-of-place artifact. And the Sphinx, I know, you wouldn't really think of the Sphinx as being an out-of-place artifact, would you? Well, Dr. Robert Schock actually did a lot of work on the Sphinx and has shown that there is an erosion pattern at the very bottom of the Sphinx that shows water erosion, which means that it had to exist around 11,000 years prior. 
Well, funny thing, uh, archaeologists argued that that couldn't be the case because there hadn't been another civilization found at 11,000 years earlier. And then, once again, they found Gobekli Tepe. So that in itself made it an out-of-place artifact. And that is a large-scale version of what an out-of-place artifact is. Tonight, we're going to deal with the smaller cases of the out-of-place artifacts. Out-of-place artifacts. The subject of artifacts found in contexts that are way out of sync with the accepted chronology of human history, known as out-of-place artifacts, has always been a controversial one. Some researchers insist that at various times in prehistory we have reached a high level of civilization, only for it to be subsequently destroyed without a trace by natural or man-made catastrophes. These out-of-place artifacts are apparently the evidence for advanced civilizations existing in remote antiquity. Do you guys think that could be the case? Do you think there was a advanced or a multitude of advanced civilizations that have existed throughout history? Perhaps civilizations that would make us look like cavemen, right? Well, let's go ahead and look at some more evidence of out-of-place artifacts and see if perhaps we have got the timeline a little wrong. Uh, just speaking humankind, we, not we here at this show. We know better here at this show. Uh, but we, using the royal we of, of humankind in archaeology, if you will, let's see if they have got those numbers just a little bit wrong. 100,000-year-old electrical component filled with mystery. Going back in 1998, electrical engineer John J. Williams found an object that appeared to look similar to that of an electrical connector. It was found in the ground on a hiking trip in North America. The object itself was found in the middle of nowhere, there were no human settlements around, no industrial complexes, roads, airports, or factories nearby. John refused to give out the exact location where he found the object, so there are many skeptics who believe it's all a hoax. Today, this artifact is better known as the Petrodox. It's a device with an undeniable similarity to an electrical component. There is a huge amount of secrecy and mystery surrounding this interesting object. John received multiple offers up to $500,000 for this strange device, and he always refused to sell it. He made sure the researchers could do their analysis on the device and made it available to them only for those purposes. The fact that he did make it available to researchers for the purposes of research is interesting to me because if it was a fake, uh, because he does seem to want to hold on to it, he also wouldn't allow it for scrutiny, however he has. Only a couple took time to study this mysterious object. And of the ones that did study it, what were the conclusions? The Petrodox is not a concretion, accretion, fossil, or pumice. It does not contain any cement, glues, resins, or mortar. According to Williams, who has done his own research on this device, he found that the object itself reveals no trace of having been glued, and he is certain that the object existed before the formation of the rock happened. According to multiple geological analysis, the rock is at least 100,000 years old. Williams and many people believe this genuine artifact belonged to an advanced ancient civilization or even an extraterrestrial race. Now, it is really hard to explain a electrical component in rock that is over 100,000 years old. Uh, that's, that's not exactly something that that archaeologists like to talk about is it something of that age that doesn't match because we didn't find electricity to the what 1800s right what was tesla 1800s maybe 1700s i don't know my history as far as that one goes so uh you guys might have me on that i don't want to misspeak again but uh the point is we didn't have electricity at the time that this artifact was supposed to have existed to begin with in the electrical type socket as you guys see the mysterious nampa figurine the Nampa figurine was found in 1889, when workers drilled the water well near Nampa, located in southwest Idaho. This artifact seems to be skillfully formed in clay, and ever since its discovery, it's been baffling scientists. According to the story, the workers reached a layer of clay over 90 meters down in the well. After reaching this point, their steam pump spat out this piece of brownish clay that looked like a small figurine. 
The object itself is described as being in great condition, bearing in mind how far down it was discovered. Those who have studied the figurine have said it looks like a female figure and does not seem to have been manufactured recently. According to Professor F. W. Putnam of Harvard University, quartz grains found under the doll's right arm were cemented by iron molecules. This is a clear indicator that this artifact might be very old. Many scientists took time and investigated this controversial figurine. They all conducted diverse tests, and they all agreed that the figurine is fully authentic and also of ancient origins. Which, as cool as that one is, and as out of place as it is, it isn't exactly rewriting any history books. However, our next out of place artifact may do just that, if it hasn't already. It's now a well-documented fact that ancient civilizations did conduct power from what's known as the Baghdad Battery. It's believed to be about 2,000 years old, and it's composed of a clay jar, copper, iron, and some type of acidic solution. Modern experiments have produced currents of at least 1.1 volts, and that's with only a small jar. Imagine what they could have done with pots about 5 to 10 feet tall. What could this power have been used for during this period? It's well known that ancient civilizations were capable of creating extremely large stone monuments, centuries more advanced than their time. Could somehow the electric current produced with the Baghdad battery have helped them accomplish some of these wondrous feats of engineering? And as we know on the pyramid and tomb walls, a lot of them are lacking a very important substance, and that is soot that would be given off by the torches used to light the way if archaeologists are right and that's how these things were built. However, there is a lack of that evidence, which means there was another lighting source used. And if you look at Dendera and the temples of Dendera, there is a picture of what is clearly a light bulb. They say it is a lotus flower, uh, yet they say being the operative words there, right? Uh, it very much looks like a modern day light bulb with a wire coming off of it nonetheless. And it makes you wonder if that wire isn't going to a large version of a Baghdad battery. A artifact that is definitely way before Energizer started producing any kind of batteries, that is for sure. Uh, they were going before Energizer started going, right? <laughs> and to this day, they keep going. All you gotta do is add some vinegar or wine juice into these jars and you have power just that simple. That's right. So, uh, that is one of a uh, another series of artifacts that have been found recently that is possibly rewriting history that even archaeology has had to uh, take double and triple looks at and admit there's something wrong with their numbers. In these particular cases, this nest, 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 this next artifact, uh, live radio is great, is an artifact that is a, uh, uh, recent finding is kind of the, one of the most well-known, right? This is one of them that when people talk about oofarts, it always comes up. So uh, I would be remiss not to mention the Antikythera mechanism. The Antikythera mechanism. According to mathematician Tony Freeth, if it hadn't been discovered, no one would possibly believe that it could exist because it's so sophisticated. Many refer to it as the 2,000-year-old computer built by the ancient Greeks and is capable of calculating astronomical positions and eclipses with unbelievable precision. Made completely out of bronze, this remarkable device thousands of years ahead of its time is one of the most complex devices of the ancient world. Precise engineered gears were used that we don't even have in watchmaking technology in modern times. This goes to show us how the Greeks had the capabilities of finally producing machinery as well as the scientific understanding of the universe. Instead of believing the gods completely controlled the cosmos, they knew that it came down to precisely defined rules, which makes this device much more advanced than we once thought. And this, of course, was found in a shipwreck off of the coast of Antikythera, Greece, I do believe it was. And this is an amazing artifact. Like he said, the gears in this artifact are so precise that we can't even replicate them today. Sound familiar? We can't replicate the pyramids either. 
or a lot of ancient structures, things that we just can't do today that the ancients could do at one time. Perhaps they even had nanotechnology, that's right. 300,000 year old nano spirals. In 1992, geologists were exploring the Ural Mountains for gold when they came across this startling discovery. They would later be known as the Russian nano spirals that we see in this photo. This means they found minuscule spiral objects while investigating mineral deposits. After several tests were conducted, they found a material known as tungsten, which is extremely rare and used in modern day spacecraft. This eerily resembles pieces found in nano machines. Scientists believe they were 300,000 years old based on the depths of the embedded gravel in which it was discovered. Tungsten is known for its melting point, higher than any element. Therefore, it has the ability to withstand extreme temperatures one would experience during space travel. So what would humans have been doing with this technologically advanced material that was clearly manufactured? Some theories claim it's debris from an alien spaceship that crashed thousands of years ago. Now, how did the ancients know to work with tungsten in such a way with the melting point as high as it was and just the same how could it come into nano spirals these are clearly designed by an intelligent source of some kind and metallurgy has always been an incredible uh, thing in the history of mankind because we know that metallurgy goes back a long time but perhaps it goes back a lot further than even we give it credit for there is a uh, special viking sword that to this day is unexplainable it is very much out of place with what we're told about the way the vikings actually lived the viking ulfbert sword we all know Vikings were some of the fiercest warriors known to man and were devastating on the battlefield, plundering much of Europe. But did they possibly possess technology thousands of years in advance? Well, archaeologists stumbled across about 170 of these blades with Urfbert written across the blade. And yes, I understand there was metallurgy at the time of the Vikings. However, these swords are a little more special. Special. It made them want to rewrite the history books on how swords were made. The process of forging the iron needed something to reach temperatures of 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit in order to liquefy the iron, which is only known to have been done in the industrial age. It also contains three times the normal amount of carbon known to be used in other medieval swords at that time. These were considered to be super swords and would have been extremely rare and valuable. How could they have possibly made these? Once again, how did they have the technology that should not have existed in that time frame? And it makes you wonder, like with the Mandela effect, we see technology going backwards in time. Perhaps that could be connected to these Uparts, right? Perhaps both of these topics could be very much connected. Perhaps the Mandela effect is what's causing these things to be found so much further back in history than they should be. It's just a theory. Like this next object on our list, a screw that is way out of time and place. 300 million year old screw. This object that appears to be a screw is fixed within a 300 million year old rock and has sparked debate among scientists. Some people claim it's proof of a long lost ancient civilization. Others think it could be the work from aliens. And once again, it brings in the question of whether or not there was an advanced civilization or even a number of advanced civilizations before our current civilization came along. The screw appears to be about two inches long, but what it's made of still hasn't been proven just yet. Skeptics are beginning to believe it's a common species of sea creature that lived millions of years ago, known as crinoids. We do know that things look a little different when they break down into false form so could this very well be just a case of mistaken identity some say that the screw is much too big to be the species of the sea creature and disregard that theory the fossilized form of a stem does have a resemblance to look like a screw and that's fair enough but keeping one more time along this theme of early metalworking long before it should have been a thing and before we get to our next object it reminds me of the 
uh, metal working that has gone on at places like Oyente Tambo and uh, Machu Picchu, Chichen Itza, and all these ancient structures that have these keyhole cuts in them in which they would molten and pour metal into. How did they learn metallurgy so early in mankind's history? Now, perhaps mankind is just more brilliant than archaeologists have told us for years and give us credit for being, or perhaps there was an outside influence, or perhaps there was a multitude of civilizations along the way. We don't really have all the answers there, but sticking with this metallurgy theme one more time, we got another object that is metallic yet way out of place. Iron Pillar of Delhi. Located in Delhi, India, is a mysterious pillar that rises 7 meters or 23 feet high. So far, that's nothing strange, right? It's a pillar of metal in the middle of Delhi, India, right? Well, this pillar apparently has some special properties to it. Properties that I'm not sure we could even recreate today. What's most intriguing about this pillar is that it's remained completely rust-free after 1,500 years. So it is made of iron, and 1,500 years of weathering, it is neglected to rust even a little bit. That's pretty wild. If that wasn't shocking enough, it's made from 99.8% pure iron. That's purer than the iron we can currently create in modern times. Now, how in the world did the ancients create a form of iron that is more pure than we can even create with today's technology? It weighs over 13,000 pounds. The pillar even withstood the firing of a point-blank cannon strike. Despite some indentation, it still stands strong to this day. Well, even in the first half here, we have already amassed a large collection of artifacts that do not uh, belong in the time frame in which they have been found, at least according to the archaeological narrative. And this is only a small slathering, of course. We've got a lot more out-of-place artifacts to go through coming up here shortly after the break, but uh, we've covered a lot so far, and it's starting to paint a picture for me. How about you guys? It's starting to paint a picture that the ancient mankind either was a lot different than what we are told ancient mankind was, or ancient man had a little bit of help from outside this world. Now, when we speak of ancient man, perhaps we could uh, be wrong about what we consider ancient man, right? So if you listen to Graham Hancock's work, uh, he used to speak of the concept that there's been a multitude of advanced civilizations and then resets, whether it be from a uh, global cataclysm of some type, from flood to comet to whatever the case may be. But it's like there's these uh, civilizations that reach this certain level and then something happens. Maybe they wipe themselves out. Maybe they reach a technological level that is just too much. And then we find humanity seeming to restart in, albeit a caveman form. And perhaps the attributions that we're giving to some of these um, cultures aren't exactly attributions that are deserved to them. What do I mean? Well, the Incas and the Mayans will tell you the pyramids that are attributed to them, they did not build. They walked upon these pyramids. They were out of place, if you will. They did not build the pyramids. There was a technology that was beyond them, something they could not do. And even in Egypt, if you look at the Egyptians, you see the pyramids that we all know, of course, the main three. But there are a bunch of smaller, really, really badly built pyramids around them. These are what the Egyptians themselves built. And they will tell you that they tried to build these and they could not replicate what was already there. Now, the time frames were given for the pyramid and sphinx is, of course, within common modern day times, but perhaps that's not actually the case. Perhaps that is merely a narrative, a scientism narrative, if you will, that they are sticking by, and they refuse to look at the all of the evidence, and you end up with things like the out-of-place artifacts. Things that don't match their 
archaeological record or their narrative that they fed us for so long. Like the Antikytheria Kytheria mechanism, Antikytheria mechanism, however you say that word. Anyway, uh, that was basically, for all rights and purposes, a computer in ancient times. We thought IBM was the first one to come with the computers, right? Nope, not so much. Turns out they had computers a long time ago. They even had the ability to build automatons, right? To build robots that would walk around and serve them. That's right. The Greeks, there's evidence, had evident, had the ability to build robots. There's so many out-of-place artifacts to cover and so little time to get there. Speaking of time, ladies and gentlemen, it is time to go ahead and take a network break right here. So uh, we will pause for station identification, and we will be back right after these messages. Don't you touch that dial. That's right. we got to stoke the fires and run off the men in black. Don't touch that dial. We'll be right back. Ow! That's right. Hi, everyone. It's AJ, the Rippin' Rabbit. Are you enjoying tonight's Jerry Hicks and the Dark Wolf's Den show? A look at out-of-place artifacts? I know I am. If you are and you haven't done so already, please make sure to thumb up that video, hit that subscribe button, and ring that bell. You'll get our notifications every time we go live. We're here every Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday nights, bringing you the very best of Common Sense Radio, the Rippin' Rabbit Hole. I'll return again tomorrow night, Friday, April 18th, starting at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10, 9 Central. Come along with me as we explore feeling good. I'm feeling good. You're feeling good. We're all feeling so good. We'll be whistling zippity doo out of our... Well, you get the idea. Then Saturday, April 17th, come along down the rabbit hole and explore with me magic mushrooms. That's right, a fascinating rabbit hole of magic mushrooms, Saturday, April 17th. Then Sunday, April 18th, kicks off something really cool brought to us by Gathering for Gardner, and that's called Celebration of Mind. And it's going to take place all next week. It kicks off Saturday, April 18th, uh, and it goes all the way to next Saturday. There's a total of 21 live events, some really Really cool mathematicians, scientists, puzzlers, magicians. We're going to talk all about it this weekend uh, with Mark Sentadicati, the co-founder of Gathering for Gardner. He's going to give us all the details and tell us how you can participate in the celebration of mind all next week. I'm looking forward to that. I've done these things before, so I'm really excited to be able to share it with you. I know during the celebration of mine, we're going to be posting some backstage events uh, that are going to happen in the VIP lounge during the celebration of mine week. So keep an eye out for some of those events to be posted as they become available. It will appear on our listen live schedule over there at ripandrabbithole.com. That's R I P O N R A B B I T H O L E.com. Jump on over over there if you haven't done so already and sign up for an exclusive backstage pass it's going to give you unfiltered access to down the rabbit hole which is our exclusive social media network and that's where you're going to be able to find a celebration of mind group that will appear there on Sunday. A lot of really cool things, and it's going to help the week go so much quicker next week as we get to celebrate the mind. Now back to Jerry Hicks and the Dark Wolf's Den with Out of Place Artifacts for Thursday, April 15th, 2021. You're listening to the Rippin' Common Sense Radio Network. This is My Life DIY, and 
Hi, this is Jojo. Hi, my name is Ash. Hey, everybody, it's AJ the Rippin' Rabbit. This is Cynthia Sue Larson. This is your man Mitta, aka Propagate This Light. And you're now listening to Dark Wolf's Den. The Dark Wolf's Den Show on Rippin' Common Sense Radio. If you were meant to be controlled, you would have come with a remote. But you didn't. And that's why you listen to the Dark Wolf's Den Show. Now, here is your host, Jerry Hicks. That's right, I am Jerry Hicks, also known as the Dark Wolf. And welcome back to the second half of the Dark Wolf's Den Show for Thursday, April 15th, 2021. Uh, So whether you're on the edge of reality, the edge of the galaxy, or the edge of your seat, We're glad you chose us to be right there with you. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we are covering Oop Arts. Oops, what? Oop Arts. Out of place artifacts. And we have covered a large number of them already in this episode. It's amazing to me that there are this many. And we've only begun to scratch the surface of the amount of out of place artifacts that there really are. We mentioned earlier the bigger ones like Gobekli Tepe and the Pyramid. Uh, Just as two examples, then we went into a large plethora of examples in the first half from uh, the Antikythera mechanism to swords that definitely do not belong where they were found and uh, even a screw that was very much out of place. At least a possible screw, right? Perhaps that one was a fossil, but like we've done many times, even if we can discount one of these, what about the other multitude of examples? Like a coin that was found to be way out of time and place. There are artifacts showing up in places that, according to the history books, are impossible. Why has the scientific establishment ignored these remarkable finds? Where did they come from? How did they get there? Which pretty well sums up what we've been discussing all evening so far, right? And unfortunately, uh, I know of all episodes, this is the episode to have pictures, right? Uh, We have tried. I'd seen a couple requests last night for pictures in the chat. Uh, This is radio, though, keep in mind, everybody. But uh, we were trying something tonight. Unfortunately, that fell through. So we're not going to be able to do the uh, pictures this evening. And I do apologize for that. But do know that we are working on ways to get that incorporated in a different way than we used to do. Now back to the show. Do you know about the main penny? Also known as the Goddard coin, the main penny isn't a penny like the Lincoln wheat cent, but a very old coin that dates to the time of the Norwegian king, Olaf Kier, who reigned as King Olaf III between 1067 and 1093. One of the silver coins minted to honor his reign somehow found its way to the Goddard site on Naskig Point in Maine almost a thousand years ago. It was discovered in 1957 along with some worked copper, pottery remnants, and other evidence of human habitation. The Goddard site has been dated by archaeologists to 1180 to 1235, and historians believe the people who lived there were the ancestors of today's Penobscot Indians. This means that this coin may have been used as metal currency in America some 500 years before the next New England silver coins, including the pine tree shilling were minted a hundred years before we would have our own silver coins minted here on the continent this coin came in and was traded apparently with the native american nations that were there at the time this is a metal vase-like object that was discovered in 1852 at the meeting house in dorchester near boston in the united states the dorchester pot as it became known was found in two pieces after the explosion and measures four and a half inches high, six and a half inches in diameter at its base, and two and a half inches in diameter at the top. The object was reported in both a local paper, the Boston Transcript, and in the June 1852 issue of Scientific America. So this is a well-documented and well-recorded out-of-place artifact. The object was blasted out of pudding stone that's part of the Roxbury conglomerate 15 feet below the surface. 
elaborately discovered with swirls and filigree, it represented metalwork of a very high degree of sophistication. And that high degree of sophistication is actually one of the issues with this object. For it to be where it was, 15 feet below the surface of the ground, embedded within conglomerate rock, it would need to be at least 593 million years old. I'm sorry, it would need to be how old? It would need to be at least 593 million years old. If the sophistication, according to archaeologists, didn't exist to build Gobekli Tepe, 11,000 years old, then the sophistication to make this ornate vase definitely could not have existed 593 million years ago, according to archaeology, right? The Roxbury conglomerate formed as an accumulation at the bottom of a rift basin, coupled with the pressure of metamorphism during the distantly remote Eddie Karen period. Were there blacksmiths working in the Dorchester area millions of years ago? Some believe that our understanding of the passage of time and the science of geology are wrong and that humans have been on Earth for much longer than our modern theories claim. Which, like I mentioned in the first half, I am very much a proponent of the theory that mankind has been cycling through this earth multiple times, had multiple advanced civilizations, and then have started over again from the beginning. The fact is, if in fact the pot was embedded in the rock that was blasted from Meeting House Hill in 1852, it would mean that metal workers existed in America over 650 million years ago or perhaps only a hundred thousand years ago if you're a believer in the views of the Falun Gong. However, archaeologists cannot accept this possibility that this artifact is so old, so they reject it out of hand. Which is a true evidence of archaeologists practicing scientism. Instead of looking at the evidence and going where it may lead, they merely reject the evidence because it doesn't fit their narrative. It may surprise many people to learn that the oldest known Ten Commandments written in Hebrew on stone may not be in the Holy Land, but in America. The controversial carving resides west of Los Lunas, New Mexico, at the bottom of a place called Hidden Mountain. Named the Los Lunas Decalogue Stone, it's also known as Mystery Stone, Phoenician Inscription Rock, or Mystery Rock. It contains the text of the Ten Commandments written in ancient Paleo-Hebrew. Paleo-Hebrew predates our modern style of Hebrew writing. This form of Hebrew writing was used for approximately 1,000 years and fell into disuse around 500 BC. The 80-ton boulder on which the writings were carved is so large that it may have been in its present-day location since the time of King Solomon, who ruled from 1014 BC to 974 BC. The more square-like Hebrew script used today came into common use after King Solomon's reign. Since the writing on this stone is Paleo-Hebrew script, archaeologists surmise that this stone dates to biblical times. During King Solomon's rule, it's known that the Israelites maintained reverence for the Ten Commandments and wrote with Paleo-Hebrew characters. As the Hidden Mountain site was accessible by ship in ancient times, it's plausible that the Israelites landed there during their voyages. Harvard scholar Robert Pfeiffer, an expert in Semitic languages, confirmed the Paleo-Hebrew script and translated the writings as the Ten Commandments, which include, I am the Lord thy God, who brought you out of the land, and thou shalt have no other gods. I would definitely say a Paleo-Hebrew writing of the Ten Commandments on stone in New Mexico of the Americas is definitely an out-of-place object to me, because, of course, we're taught that they never made it over here, right? We were taught that the Israelites never made it to the Americas, and of course the first one to make it to the Americas were the uh, Native Americans across the land bridge. That's the archaeological explanation, and it almost is becoming as goofy as the swamp gas explanation they've given ufologists for many years, right? <laughs> and there's actually a little bit more evidence that the Israelites may have made it over here to the Americas and left a little bit more 
out of place artifacts for us to find. The Newark Holy Stones refer to a set of artifacts discovered by David Wyrick in 1860 within a cluster of ancient Indian burial mounds near Newark, Ohio. The set consists of the keystone, a stone bowl, and the decalogue with its sandstone box. The site where the objects were found is known as the Newark Earthworks, one of the biggest collections from an ancient American Indian culture known as the Hopewell that existed from approximately 100 BC to 500 AD. And I'm going to go ahead and break in here and say that it's attributed to Native Americans and they're called the Hopewell, but there's evidence suggested, like we're about to hear, that may not have been Native Americans at all. The events surrounding the discovery and authenticity are controversial. A wide consensus believes that the artifacts are either the subject of a hoax or originate from a time that has no relation to the Hopewell. Others believe that the artifact's inscription contains dialect that is in fact of Judean descent and could have existed during that time. The first of these artifacts, popularly known as the Keystone due to its shape, was excavated in June of 1860. Unlike other ancient artifacts found previously in this region, the Keystone was inscribed with Hebrew. It contains one phrase on each side. The second find came later in November 1860 when Wyrick and his excavation team came across a sandstone box which contained a small black limestone rock within. The type of rock was identified by geologists Dave Hawkins and Ken Bork of Denison University. The rock was carved with post-exilic square Hebrew letters on all sides, translated to be a condensed version of the Ten Commandments. Now, wait a second. This is two different locations in the Americas, ancient Americas, where they found versions of the Ten Commandments. The inscription begins on the front at the top of an arch above the figure of a bearded man who's wearing a turban, robe, and appears to be holding a tablet. It runs down the left side, continues around all sides, and makes its way back to the front up the right side where it began. This pattern indicates that the inscription was meant to be read repetitively. Right above the figure of the man is a separate inscription which translates to Moses. Also found nearby during the same excavation was a small stone bowl about the size of a teacup, which is also on display with the other artifacts. And of course, the Mormons claim that this could be the lineage they speak of in their own Book of Mormon for those that are interested in that. But if that wasn't wild enough for you, how about something that includes dinosaurs, right? How about some out-of-place artifacts with dinosaurs? That's what we got coming up for our last uh, out-of-place artifact this evening. Another amazingly incredible find. Check this out. In 1945, Waldemar Julesrud, a German immigrant and knowledgeable archaeologist, discovered clay figurines buried at the foot of El Toro Mountain on the outskirts of Acambaro, Guanajuato, Mexico. Eventually, over 33,000 ceramic figurines were found near El Toro, as well as Chivo Mountain on the other side of town. Similar artifacts found in the area are identified with the pre-classical Chupacaro culture, 800 BC to 200 AD. The authenticity of Jules Rude's find was challenged because the huge collection included dinosaurs. That's right. This huge collection of clay figurines included dinosaurs. Many archaeologists believe dinosaurs have been extinct for the past 65 million years, and man's knowledge of them has been limited to the past 200 years. If this is true, man could not possibly have seen and modeled them 2,500 years ago. During the years 1945 to 1946, Carlos Perea was director of archaeology at Cambaro Zone for the National Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City. In a recorded interview, he described Jules Rude's excavations as unauthorized, as were many similar discoveries made by local farmers. But he had no doubt that the finds were authentic. He acknowledged that he examined the figurines, including dinosaurs, from many different sites. He was present when official excavations were conducted by the National Museum and the American Museum of Natural History. They found many figurines, including dinosaurs, which he described in detail. In 1954, the Mexican government sent four well-known archaeologists to investigate. A different but nearby site was selected, and a meticulous excavation was begun. 
six feet down they found numerous examples of similar figurines and concluded that Jules Rude's find was authentic however three weeks later their report declared the collection to be a fraud because of the fantastic representation of man and dinosaur together the collection at its largest number 33,500 figurines including musical instruments masks idols tools utensils statues human faces of many different nationalities and dinosaurs I don't know about you guys but I would say dinosaur figurines are definitely an out-of-place object for me but what do you guys think we've heard a lot of examples tonight of objects that don't uh, fall in line with the archaeological narrative that are for lack of better term out of place with the narrative could this be the evidence we need to prove that the history books need to be rewritten or could it just be a bunch of hoaxes trying to get a lot of attention in the end ladies and gentlemen all you can do is look at the evidence and apply a little common sense and in the end ladies and gentlemen you be the judge We got to close it out. That's right. That's it for this episode of the Dark Wolf's Den Show for Thursday, April 15th, 2021. Uh, so whether you're on the edge of reality, the edge of the galaxy, or the edge of your seat, we're glad you chose us to be right there with you. Ladies and gentlemen, the den may be closing, but don't you worry. The weekend fun has only just begun. That's right. We have kicked it off. And now we're going to kick it over to our uh, good buddy, AJ, the Riffin' Rabbit over there. And he's going to come back tomorrow, Friday, April 16th, 2021, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10, 9 Central, with an all-new episode of the Riffin' Rabbit Hole Live Show. And he's going to be talking about feeling good. Feeling good is something we all strive for, right? At least that's what we say we strive for. Well, perhaps there are special tips and tricks we can use to feel good more. More often. That is going to be on Friday, s- April 16th, 2021, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10, 9 Central. I don't know what I was about to say there. I really have no idea. Maybe I was going to say Saturday, April 17th, 2021, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10, 9 Central, because that's when AJ is going to be talking about magic mushrooms. That's right. This is something that may have actually helped evolve mankind and furthermore may help uh, medicinally for those who are dealing with different issues like post uh, stress disorder and things like that PTSD uh, depression there's been a lot of scientific studies but I'm not going to ruin the information you guys make sure you tune in Saturday April 17th 2021 7 p.m. Pacific 10 9 central so AJ can run down all the magic information of magic mushrooms and this is going to be a magical weekend ladies and gentlemen because on Sunday, April 18th, 2021, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10, 9 Central, AJ the Riffin' Rabbit's going to welcome his buddy, a friend of the network here, Mr. Mark Sedaticati. He is going to be joined by Mark as they discuss Celebration of Mind. That's right. This is a celebration of Gathering for Gardener. What is that all about? Well, for more information, make sure you jump on over to the theriffinrabbithole.com where you can find information on this week-long event. This is something that is very, very exciting looking to me. Uh, I, Even though I've got to work this week, I may uh, sacrifice some of my time and actually set in on some of this myself. What am I talking about? Well, check out the Riffin' Rabbit Hole and check out AJ's show on Sunday, April 18th, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10, 9 Central, as he discusses celebration of mind with Mark Sedaticati. And speaking of RiffinRabbitHole.com, make sure you hop on over there and sign up for our 24-7 lounge, I'm sorry, our 24-7 pass, our backstage pass over there. This is going to grant you the access to a lot of things on the site, like, well, everything on the site, all the magic we offer over there, like the down the rabbit hole section our exclusive social media network site over there uh, come on over and join that and uh, the topics continue 24 7 over there as well as our 24 7 backstage lounge that's right is a 24 7 website ladies and gentlemen we are open all the time 
at least we try to be. Uh, but yeah, come on over to the 24-7 Backstage Lounge if you want to hang out with me. Uh, we had our buddy D Frag over there last night. He popped in and hung out with us. That was absolutely awesome. And we had a wonderful conversation about Mandela Effect. And I had a blast. And you guys can too if you'd like to join me in the 24-7 Backstage Lounge when you sign up for your Backstage Pass at the therippinrabbithole.com. That is, as once again, R-I-P-O-N, R-A-B-B-I-T-H-O-L-E dot com. My favorite place to go all the time. And speaking of favorite places, my other favorite place to be every Wednesday and Thursday is right here with you guys hanging out on Rippin' Common Sense Radio with the Rippin' Rabbits. I love you guys. You guys are amazing. Uh, on behalf of AJ the Rippin' Rabbit, Chick Mandela Effect, Michael Musco, our amazing mod team, everyone involved in Rippin' Common Sense Radio. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Jerry Hicks, also known as the Dark Wolf. And remember, until next time we meet, stay awake, but dare to dream. Good night, everybody. How? Yeah, that's right. Just illusion I'm lost in a